Hey, if you were not moved to worship during that set, like, we had a text just saying that your wood might be wet, right? Like, <clears throat> might need to, might need to, I don't mean that condemning, but like, you might just, just ch- check your spiritual pulse there. Um, it's good to be in worship together. Amen. It's good to, to worship the Lord, fix our eyes on Him. Now, I'm excited to study the Bible with you. Hey, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, turn to 1 Timothy, where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be in chapter 6, so the very last chapter of 1 Timothy. And I'm excited to, to be in Scripture with you. We're going to start down in verse, um, verse 6 and verse 5 in just a moment. As you're turning there, I want to tell you about um, something I remember very vividly. This is probably, I don't know, probably about 10, 12 years ago. I was not about ten years ago. I was in uh, our garage uh, working on some things. We had a kayak at the time. When I was trying to fix our kayak, and as I'm in there, uh, head down, looking at the, the seats and everything in the kayak, I hear this zzz coming down the street, and it wasn't a normal sound. I thought this is not just someone on a bicycle. This is not someone driving their car. There's something different going on. So I kind of walk towards the edge of the of the garage. I look out, and the first thing I see in my uh, vision is a small dog. It wasn't a pit bull, but it was maybe a pit bull mix. And it is running with all its might. Like it is, and I can tell whatever it's doing, it's, it's dragging, it's pulling something. And on the other end of the leash is a grown man, like uh, much larger than myself, which doesn't take a whole lot, I know, <laughs> but much larger than myself. And he's riding his child's scooter. <laughs> and the dog is pulling him. I'm thinking, and as, as the guy goes by, he looks at me and he kind of gives me like a, <laughs> like, like, that's, what's up? I'm cool, right? And I'm thinking, and I'm just thinking, sir, you are going to kill your dog, right? So I'll have a good laugh. I'll go back to uh, looking at the kayak and, and messing with it. Well, a few moments later, a few minutes later, <clears throat> I hear that same noise, so I think, here, here comes the guy, going to kill his dog, uh, making him pull him on the scooter. And as he's getting closer, I, I know, kind of in my mind, I can visualize where they're at in the street. They're near a, a curve there um, where the, the, the road, there's several lines in the road, even some potholes and things. And all of a sudden, I hear a scream, and then I hear a... <laughs> so I look up, and sure enough... There goes the dog pulling the same scooter, but this time about 15 feet behind the scooter is the man running saying, hey, hey, come back, right? I don't know if he took the turn too fast. I don't know if he hit a a pothole. I don't know if he hit a little pebble in the road, but he went down. (laughs) I'm going to guess probably it it was something small, like, um, again, too fast turn, pebble, maybe a little sliver in the concrete that he didn't see. I never did get to ask him because I was laughing too hard. <laughs> but whatever it was, it, that one little thing, that one little moment threw him off his course. It tripped him up. You think about our, our, our Christian life. Often it's, it's one little thing that can throw us off course. It's one little thing that can that can trip us up, that can make a mess of us trying to pursue and follow Jesus. And for a lot of us, that one thing is money. Now, look, I've been the pastor here, I've never preached on money. I've only been here two months. (laughs) Man, for a lot of us, that's that's what trips us up in our discipleship. You know that Scripture talks about prayer 371 times. It talks about loving each other 714 times. It talks about money 2,162 times. Money is a problem for humans. And the reason the Bible addresses it so much is not because God is greedy, no, but because he cares about our spiritual development, our spiritual well-being, and he knows we get tripped up on money a lot. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a fool when it comes to my finances. 
I don't want my money to make a mess of my life. The question we're going to look at this morning, we're going to have it on the screens for you, is how can I relate to money in a way that helps me rather than hinders me spiritually? How can I relate to money in, in a way that helps me rather than hinders me spiritually? Now, when I talk about help, what I don't mean is getting rich. Like, actually, if you look at uh, the end of verse 5 in chapter 6, Paul's talking to Timothy, and he says, he's talking about people uh, who are envious and quarreling and slander and constant disagreement. And he says, people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. So Paul's saying people who think that if they're godly can now get more money, they are depraved and have a deprived mind. So if you think, you know, the problem when you, when you think that, live life that way, you're treating God like he's a vending machine. All right, God, if I just put in, put in the right numbers here, I'll get what I want from you. God is not a vending machine. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He cannot be manipulated. Well, if I, just, if I just go to church enough, if I just say the right things, if I cut this habit, then God will make me rich. That is a theology that is from the devil. It's called the prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all. And, and, and trying to treat God like he's a vending machine will not help you develop spiritually. It will not help you grow in your discipleship journey. So what, what does help? How can you relate to your money in a way that helps your discipleship journey? Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So how can I relate to money in a way that helps me rather than hinders me? Number one, real simple right there in the, right there in the text, be content. Be content. And it's, it's to quiet, to posture your heart. In a way that you say, God, I'm going to be satisfied with what you've given me. To be content. And with what? He says, but godliness with contentment. So he's not, he's, notice, he's saying we should pursue godliness. We should live a holy, pure life. That does matter. But he says, not so we can get rich. And he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. So we know from the context, from, from verse 5, he cannot mean great gain as in like, well, now you're going to be filthy rich and have all the stuff you want. No, he just, he just said that wasn't scriptural. That wasn't true. So he can't talk, be meaning that. What does he mean by great gain? I believe he's talking about the, the gain that comes, the, the riches, if you will, that come from living life as God intends you to live. The riches that come from growing in your relationship with Christ. There, good job, buddy. Way to find him. <laughs> We've all been there. It's okay. <laughs> hey, the riches that come from growing your relationship with Christ. Contentment. Do you remember what Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 through 13? He said, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing hunger, uh, uh, abundance, hunger, and abundance and need. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's one of the most misquoted, misused verses in the Bible. It doesn't mean I can do all things through Christ, so I'm going to go on this youth retreat. I'm going to do the blob. I'm going to do the high dive. I can do anything. I can eat the things that Thanksgiving I don't like. No. That's not what it means. It means you can be content. Whatever your external circumstances, however, <coughs> excuse me, how much you have or how little you have, you can learn to be content because Jesus is the key to contentment. If you have Jesus, you have all you need. Psalm 1611 says, At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. I believe that's the great gain he's talking about. Not about making it rain, money. No, getting to experience the presence of the Lord. If that's not enough to motivate you, he says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. So 
we, we can't take it with us. We didn't, we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't bring it with us. So, so we'll just be content <clears throat> with food and clothing. We, we don't need more. What did Job say when he lost everything? <clears throat> the Lord is given. The Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> you have me that water, Lauren? Sorry, y'all. Quick time out. Thank you, Vanna. Just kidding. <clears throat> There we go. All right. Back in the game. <laughs> Content with what the Lord's given you. So he's given us, okay, there's great gain in the Lord. Recognizing we didn't bring anything, we don't deserve anything, we can't take it with us, so we should be content. And then he points out some kind of, I think, negative motivation. He says, those who want to be rich fall into temptation. A trap. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away, wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Whew. That's a good reason to be content. When you relate to your money in a way that says, I just want more, and you fall into this temptation of loving money and wanting power and wanting more stuff, you think that more money will give you freedom. And he says, more money won't give you freedom. It will put you in chains. It leads to temptation. It's a trap. He says these harmful desires plunge people into ruin and destruction. Think about that. So we, we tend to think of it as I'm going to plunge my hands into this money and get all that I want, get all the stuff I want. And he says, actually, when you pursue all the things that you want and you're not content and you just seek money, money, money and riches and fame and it's all about you, when you do that, Actually, your desires have taken hold of you, and they're plunging you into things that you never intended to get yourself into. It's a warning. It's a trap. So do you own your stuff, or does your stuff own you? Is a fair question. He says it's the root of all kinds of evil. So when the tree of love of money, and i got to have more stuff, gets planted in your life, from it, all kinds of other sins and evil things grow and flourish in your life. It's kind of a scary picture. Be content. What does that look like? I've got a little helper this morning. Haddon, can you bring that box up here, buddy? All right. It's a big moment for this guy. He's very excited. Can we get up for Haddon real quick? All right, bud. Oh, man. Yeah, there you go. You're doing great. Uh, if they, oh, let's turn around. Let's turn around. Yeah, you're ready. You can tell we practiced. All right. Perfect. Okay. Keep your hands nice and open and flat, okay? I'm going to put some things in your hand. Just keep them relaxed and just resting, okay? It's kind of tempting, right? Reese's pumpkins flavor? I didn't know that was a thing. Is it getting more tempting the more I put in your hands? Got to stay healthy with the applesauce. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we'll finish it off with a moon pie. Amen. Bless the Lord. Okay. You're holding all, uh, quite a bit there. Now, I want to see something. What happens if you clench your fist and squeeze your hands? Oh! <laughs> you still got two. I do have a question, Haddon. When, it's not a trick question, buddy, when could you hold more? Were you able to hold more when your hands were like this or when you clenched your fist? Flat? Good job. I'll give it up for Haddon real quick. Good job, buddy. You want to put all this in the box for me? The deal was uh, him and sis get a piece of candy if they help me. So, <laughs> What does contentment look like? It's like this, right? See, greed, discontentment says, Ugh, I, I got I to gotta get what I want. I need more, so I'm going to grab a hold of it. That's a stressful, not at ease life. If you look up contentment in the Greek, it actually is it's, it's a quiet rest. <sighs> not, I'm, I got to grab, no, a quiet rest. And again, let's be clear. The picture of you can hold more when your hands are open. I'm not saying you get more rich. No, but great gain, as the text says. As the Lord wants to pour out blessing of 
relationship and blessing of joy and the blessing of gratitude in your life, if your hands are clenched because you're discontent, you can't hold on to those things. When your hands are open, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, I'm going to be content with what he gives me. His blessings tend to stack up. Contentment. What does that look like practically? Quick comparing to what the family beside you has, what the student in your class, what they get to wear to school. Quick comparing cars in the parking lot. Comparison distorts your view of God's goodness to you. It means that we're going to, to be content, we're going to quit Googling the things that we want to buy. That's for me. <laughs> it means just flat out a little bit less shopping. You know, I love how easy Amazon Prime is, but man, it's a little too easy. Right? I'm not, I'm not preaching against Amazon Prime. You hear me, right? <laughs> I think contentment means Spending more time with the one who can actually satisfy your soul. Be content. You know, when, when you're content, or when you're discontent, that, that grabbing on, there's a sense of control. I think it's why we, that's one of the reasons we grab onto things and, and we struggle with discontentment, is it's control, which control is really kind of a form of a pride, of a form of pride. God, I got this, I can do this, let me take the reins. I'm going to do this on my own. That's pride. If you know scripture, pride always hurts you spiritually. And to today's theme in the text, it never helps you in your discipleship. It always hurts you in your relationship to money. Jump over to verse 17. He says, still in chapter 6, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or prideful. Or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth. But on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. So we've seen, if we want to relate to our money in a way that is, helps us spiritually, helps our discipleship rather than hinders us. We've seen we need to be content. The second thing is, real simple, right here, we need to be humble. Be humble. Recognize your dependence on God. That you can't do it on your own. He says, instruct those who are rich in the present age. I'm tempted to, to point out that all of us in here, by the world standards, are wealthy, are what you could say rich. But the problem with that mindset is I think it teaches us to compare, like to always be comparing, well, I have more money than this person, and less, per, less money than this person. I think if, if we decide to relate to our money and relate to God based on what everybody else has, we will always be comparing and never be generous and never be giving and never be humble. There will always be somebody richer than you, always someone poorer than you. The point is that money, wealth, when, when times are good, it tends to make you prideful and to want to depend on yourself and on your money. So he says, don't be arrogant. Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of wealth. Now, notice two, two really indicators there that wealth is fleeting. One, he says, the rich in the present age. So by pointing out that there's a present age, he's indicating there, there's a future age, right? So just because you're rich on planet earth, it doesn't mean you're going to be rich in heaven. That's not a good indicator. And then he says, the uncertainty of wealth. So uh, two really clear reasons to not be prideful and arrogant and put your hope in yourself or in your money or your ability to control or make money because it's fleeting, it's uncertain, and it will not last. Be humble. So instead of being arrogant and saying, I got this, I'm going to hope in my money, my ability to make money. He says, instead, put your hope on God. God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Unlike your bank account. <laughs> he is who he is always. He's a sure rock. He's steadfast. He's solid. A firm foundation. And what else does it say about him? He richly blesses, excuse me, he richly provides us with all things to enjoy. So he's saying, don't put your hope in the gifts. Put your hope in the giver. He's the one who provides us with all things to enjoy. So as you think about your money and, and manage and steward your money, 
Don't put your hope in it. Put your hope in God, who is the giver of all good things. This world can take your money. It can't take away your Lord and Savior. Your hope is in Him. Be humble. You ever uh, been to the beach before and made a sandcastle? See those hands? Oh, yeah, good times. You know, it's fun to, with your siblings or whoever, to have a sandcastle competition, right? You even get the, the buckets you bought from Dollar General, right? And you go down there and you're, going, you're getting the, the right water to, to sand ratio. You're getting it all mixed just right. And you can have fun and talk some smack and, and um, be excited, have some pride in your sandcastle. But it would be foolish to get too excited, put too much hope in that sandcastle. Why? Because it ain't going to last. Like, you could spend hours making this beautiful sandcastle. And then your kids could come up two minutes later and just, pfft, right? Maybe, maybe that you weren't paying attention and you built it cl- too close to the water and the tide comes up. Things change. Or a storm comes and blows it down. It's not going to last. Putting your hope, putting your pride, your sense of security in your money and your wealth is more foolish than finding tons of excitement and joy and pride in a sandcastle because it will not last. Quit finding your worth and your identity and your security in the things of this world and find them in God himself. It means that we don't buy tomorrow, we don't make future financial decisions based only on what we have today and think, well, I'm going to figure that out. I'm, I'm sure I'll make plenty of money and I can figure that down the road. Like, no, no, we, we base tomorrow's decisions based on who we know God is, not because we think we're awesome, we can control our money. <laughs> we're, we're content, we're humble, we recognize, God, I need you. I need you. And you may be tempted to say, well, but Brandon, like, I, I worked really hard for my money, and I, I've been saving it up, and so I should have some pride in it. And you know what? Like, you don't know how gifted and talented I am. I work really hard. Hey, you're probably right. I probably don't know how awesome you are. But listen to what the Lord said in uh, Deuteronomy 8. This is verses 17 through 19, if, or 18, if you want to re- read it later. Deuteronomy 8, 17 through 18, he says, You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord, your God, gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant. He swore to your ancestors as it is today. He's saying, don't get too big for your britches. Remember, the Lord is the one that puts air in your lungs, gives you strength to actually accumulate wealth. So don't think you're your own savior, that you're your own hero. You need God. So, so far as we look at this text, we've seen, like Paul's told us, what to do with our, with our head and with our heart. So we're going to choose contentment. We're going to be humble, posture ourselves before the Lord. And this next little section, he shows us what to do with our hands. Look at verse 18. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. How can you relate to your money in a way that, is, that helps you with your discipleship rather than hinders you? Number three, be generous. Be generous. Be giving. It says, do what is good and be rich in good works. So he says, you should be rich, but should be rich in good works. That you're, you're doing what is uh, benevolent, what is beneficial to other people, not just for yourselves. And to be generous, willing to share. That uh, in verse 18, instruct, some translations say command. So this is, a, this is Paul being strong. He's not saying, hey, Timothy, you know what? You might tell the believers occasionally, hey, you guys might give a little. No, he's saying, hey, tell them, command them, instruct them, be generous. Give above and beyond what is expected or deserved. By the way, he's not talking here about tithing. Like, that's a thing in the Bible. Like, we, we should do that. But he's talking about, I would say, above and beyond. So being generous to people above and beyond. Being generous to to the causes of the kingdom above and beyond what you may think is 
expected or deserved. Be generous. Why should we be generous? Like, really simple church answer. (laughs) Because Jesus was generous to us. Beyond what we expected or certainly what we deserved. Scripture tells us that because of our sin, we deserve death, hell, and damnation. This is what we deserve. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus, God the Son, left heaven, come, came to this earth, put on flesh and blood, and died for your sins and my sins. We deserve death, but Jesus took on that punishment so we could have forgiveness, life, and hope. And not just be forgiven and like have a pretty good life on this earth. No, we get to live with him in eternity forever. That is the definition of generosity, being much more than we expected or deserved. The cross, the empty... Uh, The empty grave of Jesus shows us what true generosity looks like. So we're generous because of the generosity of Jesus. We give not because of what we have. We give because of who has us. We're generous because of Jesus. Your discipleship journey should reflect the generosity of the Lord. And, And here's what's cool. I feel like it kind of turns a corner here in verse 19. We expect him to say, because as you're generous, it's a blessing to all these other people, which it is. But look at what he says. As you're generous, willing to share, you're storing up treasure for themselves. Let me back up here. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age. Now what's he saying? As you're generous, he's saying, you get the benefit. Get not, not health and wealth like, all right, give this $100 and you get $1,000 back. Bless the Lord. That's not what he's saying. No, as, as you're generous, you're investing in the things of the kingdom. You're laying a foundation, he says, for eternity, for the coming age. Think about a foundation, even in our terms. A foundation, while it's not real exciting, it's necessary because it's preparing the way for what's coming next. When you are generous, you're investing in eternity. You're preparing for the future. And more than that, he says, so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So you can say, oh, wait a second. Is he saying, like, if we want to be saved, if we want to be forgiven of our sins, we need to be generous? No, we know from all of Scripture, and particularly, especially Paul, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, if you do this, then you'll get saved. No, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. You all tracking with me? So he can't be saying, give, and then you'll get saved. No, I think he's referring to what John excuse me what Jesus refers to and recorded in the gospel of John chapter 10 verse 10 the thief the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy but Jesus has come that we may have abundant life what is truly life so satan wants you to be greedy to 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 be discontent to be prideful to hang on to all that you have and in so doing you actually are trapping yourself and you're actually missing out on what is truly life. That as you are open-handed and humble and generous, as God leads you to give and to be generous, as you do that, you get to then experience the abundant life that Jesus promised you. How many of us are missing out on abundant life because we're clinging to our money like it's ours and not God's? Like you've heard the old silly like preacher joke like, you know, when, when you're baptized, you don't get to hold your wallet out of the water, right? You know, I heard that before. <laughs> yeah, like, no, I, I, we wouldn't. Like if, if you tried to hold your purse or your wallet out of the water as we baptized you, I'd be like, hey, I don't think you get this. You don't get to hold on to some things and give God the rest. No, it's, Lord, it's all yours, including the wallet. And in so doing, we get to experience, I'm not going to be able to do that, right? <laughs> we get to experience Abundant life. So, so think about this. We tend to think the more money I get, the more blessed I want to bless, the more blessing I want to give myself. So we we are as we get income or wealth accumulates, whatever, we tend to, to look in the mirror and go, what do I want? What can I get? But I love what C.S. Lewis said, kind of 
in similar thought to what this text is saying, that God doesn't increase your wealth so you can increase your standard of living. He increases your wealth so you can increase your standard of giving. So we don't look at our money and go, this is my what I want to get. And we, we put down the mirror and we look out the window, God, who do you want me to bless? Because I'm commanded to be generous, not selfish. And here's the cool thing. I think this is what this text is saying. I want to take hold of what is truly life. So as, as I'm looking in the mirror, like literally if you look in the mirror in the morning and you're thinking there's got to be more to this life. I thought there was a more abundant life to be had. Paul's saying, quit looking in the mirror financially and look out the window and be a blessing to other people. And as you do that, you do actually get the reward of experiencing the abundant life God promised you. How many of us, we've been tripped up financially and it's tripping up our walk with the Lord, our discipleship? And it's just one little small thing. The Lord is inviting us to something better this morning. See, God commands you to give and to be generous, not because he wants something from you, listen to this, but because he wants something for you. He wants you to grow in your discipleship journey. He wants you to experience the abundant life he has for you. It's an invitation to something better. So be content, be humble, be generous. Again, for a lot of us, this might just be one little adjustment that could have tremendous impact on our walk with Christ. You ever, when you're getting ready in the morning, you're buttoning your shirt, and you get down to the bottom, and your shirt looks like your shirt looks like this, right? Especially if you're in a hurry, you got to unbutton it all and do it again. What happened was you you just got one button miscalculated, and it threw everything else off, right? This happens in our discipleship journey. I think when this one little issue is off kilter, off balance, it kind of throws the rest of everything off. The Lord's inviting us to get that right this morning. To relate to our, to our money in a way that's helpful, not hurtful. To be content, humble, and generous. So we're going to have a we're going to have a time of response. We're going to have a, a two-part response time this morning. I promise I'm watching the clock. We're going to be out here on time. It's going to be great. Two-part response time. The first thing I want to call us to do is as believers, just pray. Ask that God would help us to learn to be content and humble and generous. That we would repent for not being those things too often. Lord, would you, would you create in me a content heart, a humble heart, a generous heart? I want to give you a moment just to, if you want to, bow your head. If you want to, come down to the altar. Just ask the Lord to change your heart, to stir your heart in this area. I'll give you a moment to do that. God, would you help us to know that you are better than the things of this world. We know our hearts are prone to wonder, prone to leave the God we love, to attach to these other things of this life. God, would you help us to cling to you where there's true joy, true satisfaction, true contentment. Would you create a humility in our lives 
that submits to your lordship and leads to generous giving. We ask you for these things, Jesus. I feel like it somewhat is a miracle for that change to take place in our hearts. But God, we know you can do above and beyond what we can ask or imagine or think. We ask you for it, Jesus. Second part of our response time this morning. We intentionally uh, didn't have our giving time earlier because it seemed appropriate this morning to, to give after hearing the text, right, and hearing what God has to say about giving. I think one of the best ways, uh, not just logically but biblically explained, that we can learn to have a, a, a content heart, a humble heart, a generous heart is just through regular giving. I believe that the biblical standard is 10% of your income. By the way, I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give, all right? I think that's the standard scripturally, but we're called to, to give certainly regularly, not just because, listen, again, I want to say God doesn't need your money. He doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. As you learn to give regularly, being contented, humble, and generous, God works in your heart. So on the random, or not random, the rare occasion that we really lean into money around here, know that it's because the Lord loves you and wants what's best for you. Y'all hear that? So some of you this morning, maybe you're maybe like, it's time to start giving, but there's no way I could give 10%. Hey, I get that. And we're not going to say like, well, don't if you can't give 10%, don't give anything. No, I think the challenge would be give something. What if you began today to start just giving something regularly? Not to, not to Harpeth Heights, not to Brentwood Baptist, no, to the kingdom of God. And watch God work out there and watch God work in your heart. So we're going to have a chance to give this morning. Again, if you don't regularly give, man, I want to challenge you, invite you, invite you is the right word, encourage you and invite you to be a first-time giver this morning and watch the Lord work in your, watch the Lord work in your life. But, but there's something else here as this second part of giving. The text clearly says we're commanded, instructed to be generous. That's, that's above and beyond our regular giving. So we across all of our Brentwood Baptist Church families this morning, we have different ways at each campus of how we're, we're encouraging and inviting you to be generous. And not just, I want you to think not just in terms of families, but as individual believers. To be generous this morning. And you may have seen this in the weekly email this past week, but the way we're going to be generous is to give to our food pantry here. It's a ministry we have here out of Harpeth Heights that blesses, I believe, eight counties in the area. Must about eight counties in the surrounding area. And so we're going to put this slide up on it. There it is. Way to go, team. You can text BOX to 623-623, and you can give there. There's also a link uh, on the, the bulletin, the electronic bulletin. You can scan the QR code. You can go to our website. Several ways you can give. You could take that envelope this morning, fill it out, and write food pantry Christmas boxes on there. But here's the challenge this morning. It's about $22 to fill up a box. And this is everything the average size family would need for a good southern Tennessee Christmas dinner. Mac and cheese, ham. We could stop right there for all I care, right? Like, it's got a lot more than that. Stuffing, dessert, all kinds of good stuff. It's about $22. So our challenge is that every believer would, would generously give $22 to be able to give a box. Now, for some of you, generous right now might be $2.20. And I would say, hey, that's awesome. Like, you don't hang your head about that. Oh, it's not that much. No, you give generously and watch God work in you and through you. For some of you, generous is not $22. For some of you, generous might be $220. Generous might be $2,200. Whatever it looks like to be generous, the command from Scripture is to be generous. These boxes are going to be able to picked up, be picked up December 19th, 20th, and 21st. We've been, uh, Susan Foster, our missions minister, has been working with uh, different schools in the area to help get the word out to families. And whatever uh, money is raised in addition to what is needed for those boxes will go directly to the food pantry here. So if you're like, I don't like giving to churches, you're not giving to us. You're giving to the food pantry to bless families in need. And I would say you're not giving to the church anyways, you're giving it to God. Amen? So I want to give you a moment 
to prepare to be generous. So I'm going to ask our ushers to come on down front. I'll, I'll pray in a minute. But as they're coming, I want you just to have a moment to prepare to be generous. If that's texting the number on the screen, if that's uh, putting something in the baskets as it comes by, if that's going to the website and clicking that link and, and giving there to the Christmas food pantry, I'll invite you to do that. So really two things are happening at once. We're doing our regular giving and we're being generous by giving to the, these Christmas boxes. Be a blessing to the people around us. And as we do, we're investing in eternity and we get to experience and take hold of the abundant life God has promised us as believers. I'll give you a moment to prepare to give. God, we're so grateful for your generosity to us. Lord, I pray that all of us would hear the words of Scripture this morning as an invitation to give, that there is joy, there is spiritual benefit, there is life abundant to be rejoiced in as we participate in giving as you've called us to give. And God, to not just give regularly, but to also give generously above and beyond. Would you help us to respond boldly this morning? God, as we give and here in just a moment, as we sing and sing of your goodness, would you stir our hearts for you, Jesus? Lord, we love you. Look forward to what you're going to do even right now as we give. It's your name we pray.